Good all and welcome back to Who's Call. This will be a video about how to pick a one-handed fighting axe to be used in conjunction with a center grip Viking Aero shield. I've been wanting to make this video for quite a while now because I feel that there are practically no resources out there on how to pick a proper axe and when I looked for an axe myself, I found that not only were there not really resources talking about what constitutes a good one-handed axe, but the market of axes was really, really bad. And I will get to why that is in a little while. But first, this video may upset a few people. And the reason for this is because you might have bought an axe an expensive axe, weapons are expensive, and you may have fallen in love with it and uh, you feel that this is a really good axe and I feel like a proper Viking and then some asshole on the internet comes and says that it is shit and this might provoke you but I hope that you will get over yourself quickly because weapons are about, functional weapons are about life and death and if you let your ego come in the way, then you just have a pretty wall hanger. Uh, I want all my weapons and all my equipment to be able to function in battle. And that is my hobby. That is simply my hobby, having equipment that works. Uh, so, back to the axe. Why is an axe good? Well, to be able to answer the question why you would want an axe, you need to look at the advantages and uses of an axe in regards to fighting with a center grip shield. As you can see behind me here, I have a center grip shield that I've made myself. And the whole point in using center grip shields is to use the shield to control the center, the space between you and your opponent. So the shield should be out here and you should with your shield try to manipulate your opponent's shield so you can get an opening and then kill him with your primary weapon, in this case an axe. So why not just use a sword? Because a sword has a bit more length, uh, a sword is more nimble, a sword is a little bit faster, but the axe has a lot of advantages of its own. The biggest of them all is that with an axe you can actually hook your opponent's shield. So in the fight for the center, where you manipulate your opponent's shield, you can actually use your axe to hook your opponent's shield. If you just imagine that there is an opponent, I can hook his shield down, place my shield over, and then strike him in the face. And this is an advantage that a sword doesn't really have. And I believe that this is one of the reasons why the Vikings liked axes so much. Because in Viking culture, personal combats and duels were very commonplace. It was a, uh, a legal way to settle disputes uh, and was a cultural and a legal tradition. And if you are in a, a duel, you want to win, and any advantage that you can get is going to be a good advantage. Now, that is not saying that they would always pick an axe. I think that they would pick the weapon that they were the most proficient with, but this is simply one of the reasons why an axe is a good weapon for this type of thing. So, if we then see that one of the main advantages with an axe is manipulation of shields, there are a number of conclusions that we can draw from it. The main one is that an axe must be light enough to be able to move around a lot. And this axe, for example, uh, made by Don Pechnik at 
uh, Noric steel. Um, this axe weighs about 750 grams uh, in this form that it is in right now. And I would even say that this is bordering me too heavy. But I am a pretty strong guy, so I feel that I can use a axe that weighs this much. So the first most important aspect of what makes a good axe is actually the weight. Because if you need to be able to manipulate and chase openings and then chop and then be able to recover, you can't have an axe that weighs 1.3 kilos or 1.6 kilos and this is so so important and this is where a lot of people will be kind of provoked by what I'm saying because 95% of all axes out there on the market for one-handed use weighs 1.3 kilos 1.6 kilos and this is so so stupid and this has no basis in in the historical artifacts uh, this has some basis in like two-handed Dane axes and stuff like that but that is not the same thing at all if you can't do this with your axe 15-20 times then your axe is too heavy for you if you strike with a heavy axe and it is too heavy to recover your opponent will simply put his shield over your axe and strike you in your face and you will die the only proper way for you to win the fight with an axe that weighs so much that if you swing it you can't recover it is if you kill your opponent with your opening blow but guess what a heavy weapon is also a slow weapon. So if you come lumbering in with a heavy slow weapon and your opponent blocks it with your, his shield and then takes his fast, nimble, light, nice axe and puts it in your face, you have lost. And if your weapon makes you lose, it is a bad weapon. So the number one thing, the most important thing is the weight. It cannot be this one and a half kilo one-handed axes. Those are just, those are clubs. Those, are, those aren't even good clubs. Uh, they are objectively bad. And I'm sorry to have to say this if you own one of those axes, ax but you, you should actually just hang it on your wall. It's a nice wall hanger. And this may sound a little bit harsh, but this is my biggest gripe and the, the industry and the market and the people who makes these kind of axes need to hear that you are not making a functional and good weapon. You are simply not doing that. You're making a, a, a wall hanger, something uh, cool that somebody has watched uh, Vikings might want to swing around for a few times and then forget about. A real weapon needs to be light. I would recommend an ordinary guy or a girl who wants to fight like a viking with an axe i would recommend a, an axe that weighs around five six hundred grams at most that, that is a good weight the only reason why i'm walking around with a 750 gram axe is because i am i am pretty strong i can do that but you do not really sacrifice any killing power with going for a lower weight. You really don't. One of my guilty pleasures is watching Forged in Fire, uh, the forging show. And I don't know if you've realized, but in 90% of the time when somebody makes a weapon that is too heavy, it won't cut because one of the biggest factors in cutting power is speed not weight, it's speed. And it has been demonstrated by cutting tests and stuff like that forever. So aside from weight, what is the number two thing I think you should um, watch for when picking your one-handed battle axe? The steel. A lot of like off-the-shelf uh, produced, mass-produced axe 
do not specify what type of steel it is. And if you buy some mystery steel, you might get uh, not even forged steel, but cast steel. Uh, you might get steel that is not suitable for fighting. Um, this axe has, I think it's 1080 steel. And all those kinds of steels, uh, like from 1045 to 1090, and also uh, spring steel and uh, other uh, hardenable steels like that are perfectly fine. But don't get an axe that has some kind of mystery steel, like um, let's say Hanway's axes. They have a line of axes that looks pretty good, but I haven't found anywhere specified what kind of steel it is. And that is kind of like buying a car without knowing what kind of motor it has. Uh, if somebody would sell you a car and, and they said, but you don't need to know what kind of motor it is. Uh, you don't even know if it's a diesel or it's a gasoline car, then you're kind of in trouble. And it could be a, a very, very good uh, steel. It really could be, but if the seller doesn't specify what type of steel it is, he is not selling to a a market that is really that keen and interested in in pure functionality. Then the seller is selling to like people who watch a little bit of Vikings and want a cool axe. And if you do that, that is perfectly fine. But once again, this is about functional weapons that you would want to take with you to war. The third point of how to pick a one-handed Viking axe or a fighting axe is I really recommend getting an axe that where the axe head conforms to uh, one of the types of axes in Pedro Sun's axe typology. The reason for this is that if you get an axe that conforms to uh, a certain historical typology, you kind of know that the axe maker has some kind of interest in what constitutes a historical axe and what constitutes a good axe. Uh, simply, if the smith is a little bit nerdy and likes typologies, you can probably imagine that he takes care and is interested in his craft and not just uh, trying to hammer out a couple of axes to sell to someone. Try to find a, a smith that has genuine passion and people who make Weapons according to typologies are often a little bit more passioned than not. This axe is a type L axe and I really like this type of axe. It's usually used for two-handed Dane axes, but I like it because I think it is pretty sexy and it has a very pronounced horn here that you can actually thrust with. And the final point. As with any weapons, I think that you should, if you buy a, a mass-produced weapon, then you can't really get to know the smith. And if you can't really get to know the smith, then you don't really have a way to gauge if, if he has passion for his craft. I know that the, the, the smith that made my axe has a genuine passion for crafts. Uh, his craft. He even uh, goes here to Scandinavia to visit museums and uh, look at and feel at axes, uh, if I understood his hobbies correctly. Uh, and I think that is kind of a prerequisite. Okay, so this has been my video on how to pick a one-handed fighting axe. I hope you enjoyed it. Stay safe, wash your hands and try not to go out pillaging until the corona crisis is over. Tack så mycket. Ha en bra dag.